Now that you're here at Grief to Growth, I'd like to ask you to do three things. The first thing is to make sure that you like, click notifications, and subscribe to make sure you get updates from my YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support me financially, you can support me through my tip jar at grief2growth.com. It's grief2growth.com slash tip jar, or look for tip jar at the very top of the page or buy me a coffee at the very bottom of the page, and you can make a small financial contribution. The third thing I'd like to ask is to make sure you share this with a friend through all your social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Thanks for being here. Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, this is Brian back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Sarah Brassard. Um, she's been with us once before, but I wanted to bring her back because we've got a very special announcement we're going to be talking about today. So I'll introduce Sarah and then we'll talk about what the announcement is that we have to, to give you. Uh, she's the author of Inside, A Guide to the Resources Within. She's a 30 plus year spiritual teacher. She's a trauma worker and she's a life coach. She runs an online community called The Tribe Inside, which is a mastermind group. Oh, a mastermind group called the Inner Circle and a nine month intensive group coaching to help women heal and grow through hardships. She also hosts the annual Trauma Recovery Summit featuring diverse voices of authors, coaches, healers and psychologists providing healing wisdom and tools to people from all walks of life. And we're going to be talking a lot more about that in a few minutes. So with that, I want to introduce Sarah Broussard. Hi, Brian. So nice to be with you today. Hi, Sarah. It's, it's good to see you again. Um, I just read your intro and, and tell people a little bit about yourself, but I'm curious, how did you get in the work of doing trauma recovery? Well, I would say it's through healing myself, truthfully. Uh, I got to a point in my life early on um, after the loss of my mother, she left our family at 13 and my father died when I was 16. So a life that seemed like it was clipping along pretty beautifully all of a sudden wasn't. And um, as someone that addresses life with a lot of sensitivity, I found myself floundering um, in a way that was affecting me at all levels, physically, emotionally, mentally, and ultimately spiritually. What that meant for my life was that there was so much shame associated with the loss of my parents that at that young age, I did everything I could to not let anybody see that loss or that abandonment. I really, I would say, just sort of put this facade on, put this, uh, uh, created this life around me that felt pretty uh, secure truthfully, uh, in that time. And in, 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 it was the best I really could do it is how I survived. But after about 10 or 15 years of just locking people out and making things look as pristine as I thought they possibly could, things started to break down. Hmm. And for me, it really happened at a physical level. I think we all experience these traumas in different ways, don't we? For me, it was a physical uh, breakdown. So there was uh, bronchial pneumonia. Uh, I had shingles at a very young age. And uh, all these physical aspects were just so overwhelming that it was really hard to carry on. And ultimately, that is what drew me to the work. I, I remember having this awakening, if you will, that was uh, drawing in all of these really vulnerable 
scary situations. It could be different people. It could be different events. But there was one common denominator to that experience, and it was me. And they just would keep coming until one day I remember just feeling like, oh, wow, I, I, I just, I can't go on. I've got to figure out what I'm doing to draw this in. I didn't even have that level of understanding. Of course, as spiritual teachers, we know that, right? That we, mm-hmm. that we draw this kind of energy to us us to to ultimately learn and and move through it but I didn't know that at the time all I knew was that I was just at the end of my rope with the same experiences or the same types of people that were just bringing so much sadness um, and suffering to me and really what I realized was it wasn't about them at all or the circumstances it was really just about me so that guided me inside you know and and uh, ultimately took me on the path I'm on. Yeah. And one thing I, I do want to go back to what you said earlier about, you know, the loss of your parents. You talked about shame around that. So tell, tell me more about the shame. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've realized is that when we experience trauma, you know, we can experience trauma. And I, I call them the original wounds, you know, between zero and seven or generously between zero and 14. And that if there isn't a way like our, our young brains, I'll just use myself as an example. Mm-hmm. My young brain really couldn't process the fact that, you know, my mom had made a decision to leave our family because of whatever insecurities she was realizing at that time. Um, or even the loss of my dad. I mean, it's not like, you know, he had it, he could have done anything about uh, his death. He died of leukemia. Um, But still, it felt like I wasn't worth staying for. So so I adopted the shame because my young brain, my young mind really couldn't imagine or think beyond that, couldn't really uh, make any sense of, of what was going on. It was just they were here and now they're not. (laughs) And uh, and that felt pretty devastating. Yeah, I think I wanted to, I wanted to emphasize that point because I think that's really important to, for people to understand, especially for children. They uh, and, and it happens to adults too, right? We yeah. we blame ourselves when other people when other people die or when other people leave, but especially for children that we inter- children internalize that. So yes. as, as parents, if we're around children that are going through that, we need to be sensitive to the fact that they think everything's their fault. If their parents get divorced, it's their fault. If they're father or their mother dies it's somehow their fault it's so true brian it's so true and you know i i think it's it's an interesting thing in my healing you know we continue to heal don't we we're on a path of healing and this is a lifelong path of healing but what is revealed to me the more i move into my practice the more committed the more consistent i become i have reconnected with that young person myself and this, uh, the amount of empathy and compassion that I have for that person, that young girl that lost everything, wasn't available to me when I was experiencing that loss, right? I mean, you're in survival mode. You're in survival mode. And, um, and so I, I, I just want to really sort of uh, hold that up for people because oftentimes we think, my God, when is when are there going to be results? When is this going to be over? When is this healing going to be over? And and I think the more that we can adopt this understanding that this is a lifelong course of action, um, and that it gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter the more we dedicate ourselves to it, that we start to have this relationship with possibly this lost side of ourselves that. Mm-hmm. Um, experienced that trauma so long ago yeah i you know i i did some some work like that when i was in therapy well, 30 20 30 years ago i guess and i remember my counselor talking about you know this inner child thing and for me i was like okay yeah. what does this even mean what's an inner child you know and i realized now 20 years later we always carry that inner child with it that, that that child goes along with us as as we're adults and even old people and right. you're right those those wounds while we can work on them they still there's they're still there yes yes 
and don't we know them? You know, I always say they're built into the or woven into the fabric of our life, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it was written this way. We came in to to hold these lessons, and we will leave with them too. And and what I've noticed in my own life is that when I'm in a weakened state, or when I'm overwhelmed, or when I'm anxious, that they come back up rapidly, that these triggers, these insecurities, these vulnerabilities, these shameful thoughts creep back in. And, and now, you know, as a seasoned practitioner, I'll go, oh, there you are. Okay, yeah. yes. Uh, what do I need to do now? Because uh, this doesn't feel good. But I understand that this isn't really you know, what's going on. This is just an indication, a red flag that says, hey, Sarah, uh, get some self-care in, in place, girl, because uh, this doesn't feel great. Yeah, it's really good to get to that point. So let talk, let's talk about your, your healing journey. What were some of the first modalities that you that you tried when you get to this point of where it's like, what's work, what's, it's what I'm doing is not working. So what did you try first? Yeah, well, I think it's worth, uh, speaking about my first career. So my first career was that I, I opened a women's clothing store when I was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I did very well by it. You know, it was a boutique, and it had all sorts of uh, wonderful things. And I, I loved it. But it really indicated where I was in my life to me, you know, that I was in a place of wanting things to look beautiful on the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, how she dresses, how she looks, present in a certain way. And um, after 10 years of doing that, I, I rapidly realized that uh, that wasn't going to take me any further. And it was kind of this trajectory to where I eventually went. And my first, uh, the first direction I went was, as I said, my body was breaking down. So I became a massage therapist and entered a two year certification program. And it was an intense reality. You know, I had incredible teachers that started to teach me that, wow, uh, first and foremost, everything is connected. <laughs> no element, as I call it in my book, is separate than the other. So the physical isn't separate than the mental. The mental isn't separate than the emotional. And, and that for me, I mean, even the cadaver work we, we did in that program was phenomenal because, I mean, just working with uh, a physical touch on a, on a human that's uh, somebody that's alive, so very different than when you're actually touching a structure that is no longer here. Mm -hmm. And uh, learning about, you know, the physicality. And I remember something that was so fascinating. We had done a cleanse at one point and they had you working with people prior to the cleanse and then working with people after the cleanse. And the difference in the tissue really started to, uh, you know, initiate, initiate this understanding for me that, my God, it's, it's the food we eat. It's the thoughts we, we digest. It's the emotions we hold on to that this incredible vessel that we move around in is so intertwined with all of it. So that really is where I started. Uh, I then went into um, a Kundalini yoga program that I did in 2004 Kundalini taught me discipline. It was an incredible opportunity to get out of my comfort zone because I, I did it at an ashram. So it was very different. I mean, you know, their kind, their disciplines and the way they work and, you know, waking up for sadhana at 4.30 in the morning, um, just all of this extraordinary learning uh, taught me how I could really be proactive in my healing. And alongside what I'd learned with massage therapy, uh, it just got deeper and more profound and more interesting to me. You know, it just was, I felt like, wow, I really have the power to heal myself. And I, I, I got to tell you, Brian, I, I had never felt that before. Mm -hmm. um, 
from there, I went into seminary. I went into a seminary program, an interfaith seminary program. And, and I call that kind of my graduate school because that just weaved in all the religions and it was more universal. And I, uh, I just, um, I don't know, I, I, I am just on a path of learning that has just guided me to such extraordinary uh, teachers and um, colleagues and clients. And I, I feel truly blessed by, by the track of, of um, learning that I, I've been able to, to accomplish. Yeah, it sounds like an incredibly well-rounded learning experience. The one thing I find really interesting, because I talk to a lot of people that are healers and people that are mediums and stuff, so many people start in massage, and I think a lot of us think of massage as just like, oh, you're just rubbing the body. And we don't really make that that connection that people you know that get into massage therapy. I, I don't know the people if they know that going in, or if they find out once they get into the massage therapy that when you're in a room with somebody and you're making that connection, it's more than just physical. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's it's a very important thing to do, and it's it, it was a great foundational practice for me because one of the things that I was taught was the sensitivity scale. And, you know, a massage therapist's hands are so intuitive. So you can go and address a body, but without communication and without ethics and understanding around how to interact with trauma in the body, uh, you can put people in, in jeopardy. So one of the things that we were taught was the sensitivity scale. So when you're addressing a certain area, you intuitively know that there's something going on there. So you ask them, you will ask your client, you know, what kind of sensitivity are you feeling here? Typically, they're not feeling a lot. So you can feel that and it's hard as a rock. Mm -hmm. They're not feeling much at all. So as a, as a therapist, if I just say, oh, there's something I got to address it, and I just go in, it can throw people into an emotional state, who knows where trauma landed in their body, right? Who knows? So when you really create a relationship with your client and have this ability to see how their sensitivities feel in their body and make them feel as safe and comfortable as you possibly can. Typically, it's not in just one session, right? It's you have clients for long, time, long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the proverb, it's the proverbial peeling the onion, you know, you just work with them. It's like therapy in many ways, but in a whole different way that you're just, you're working with their trust, you're working with their safety, you're working with, uh, um, their, with their being, with their, you know, humanity. And uh, that takes a lot of time and a lot of respect. Yeah, it sounds, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, again, the things that we learned and the different, the most, I, I'm always fascinated to talk to people about different modalities and what things you, you've got to bring you to where you are and how, and how you weave those together into your now unique offering that, that Sarah Brassard offers. Yeah, thank you for that. It's very kind of you. I, uh, I feel really, it's the way, if my, it's the way my book, it's the way I set up my book is that, you know, I really wanted people not so much to be directed towards any specific spiritual track, but how do you get into a practice, how do you get, how do you stay consistent? How do you start to realize an experience? Not because I'm telling you about that experience, not because Brian's telling you about that experience, but because you are actually experiencing it yourself. And I think once that happens, we know that Brian as practitioners, you and I, but once that starts happening, and it happens pretty rapidly, truthfully, in the beginning, you know, when you have consistent practice that you're doing. What ends up happening is that there's just, I, I explain it as, it's almost like there's room made in my, in my brain. I'm making space. I'm, I have room that I didn't have before I was doing this. Mm -hmm. Because I always say trauma takes up a lot of space in your head, yeah. in your mind. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's interesting as you talked earlier, because we started talking about trauma in the body. And again, there's another thing I think that people, at least I didn't understand for a very long time, is that the trauma does live in the body and it can manifest in so many different ways. And we think, oh, I'm just sick. Oh, I've just got bronchitis or I've just got this this ache or this pain. And a lot of time it's it's a reaction to trauma. And we have to we have to address the body as well as the mind and the, and the spirit. Uh, and we can, it's really, a, you know, like a, like a three-legged stool, I guess we have to address. That's right. That's right. So well, how does your book help people get into a practice? Well, we really just take it uh, right from the beginning. I mean, you know, I like to give people a little bit of an understanding of my story. I don't dwell a lot on my story because, you know, truthfully, it's it, it was just one of those uh, foundational blocks that I had that allowed me to move in the direction I have with my life. So I'd like to bring up certain points around creating what I call the observer or the witness consciousness, that we start to get into relationship through meditation practices, reflective practices, whatever it is that you decide, you know, meditation is a loaded word, right? People don't always know how to deal with meditation. I like to say, what are you doing that guides you towards yourself every day? And, and how can you do more of that? How can you do that really, really consistently? Because that's what it takes is taking our attention from, you know, the outward activities of our life inside. So just like you said, Brian, you know, noticing, wow, I have a stomach ache every time I meet that person or I go to do this certain activity, my belly is so tight. Now we could just ignore that and go, oh, there's no relationship between that person and my belly. Or we could start to say, wow, interesting. Happened last time, happened again. Hmm, there could be a relationship here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, you know, a beautiful example of what we call the witness consciousness or the observer. Um, that's also what people like, well, I, I want to say you, because I'm sure you're doing this kind of work too, Brian. That's what I do with clients until they've actually created that ability to observe themselves from the outside in. I help facilitate that. So I'm asking those kinds of questions, right? Could there be any relationship between that person and that bellyache or, you know, so in my book, I really just try to guide people to the experience is what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I, I'm conscious of the fact that we're using words that intimidate a lot of people, you know, sure. meditation. I always hesitate to use meditation because people say, I can't sit for 30 minutes and just do nothing. Or when we use the word practice, that sounds like work. Um, so how do you help people overcome that that hurdle? Well, that's, uh, well, I, I, let me address the meditation piece first. Mm -hmm. the, the meditation piece is, it. if we could just take that word away for right now, and just again, let's talk about it being, you know, self-care or anything that we can do. Hey, let's just say it's a, it's a beautiful time of year, right? Let's just say that, you know, I walk out of my office and there's a, a gorgeous uh, hydrangea right there and I see hummingbirds and there's something enlivened in me by that experience. Or I see my daughter who I haven't seen in three months walk up the sidewalk and there's just joy in my heart. These are the kinds of experiences that we want to do more of. Mm -hmm. What is it that's enlivening your heart? And can you pay attention to that? Can you stay with that? And that I believe is self-care. That is caring enough about what enlivens my spirit to want to go back and do it again. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's just not coincidentally, because we're here to talk about the Trauma Recovery Summit, but I was just recording a piece for that earlier um, on self-care. And, you know, I to me, I've been, I've been doing this work formally now for about three years. I've been doing it, you know, informally for a very long time. And I think that's the most important thing for people. And so when we say things like like meditation, again, I think I'm going to go sit in a room 
and light a candle or lights of incense, but it could be going outside and sitting on your deck and watching the sunset, which I love That's to right. do. Our deck oh. overlooks the, the, you know, a valley and there's a sun. It could be, like you said, looking at a hummingbird and just being intentional about it. So we're, we're not asking people to do things that are hard. We're asking people to do things that are actually enjoyable. That's right. That's right. Yes. It's, it's, it's an important point, I think, because we lose sight of that in our life. There's so much that comes at us and it can just be that life is full and busy, but we can also shut ourselves down in various ways, as we know, you know, maybe that's sitting in front of a TV watching, you know, streaming crazy amounts of TV, which we've all done. I mean, it's, there's, there's not a judgment thing. It's just really noticing when you are in a place of receiving something that enlivens your heart or spirit. And when you're in a mode that says, um, you know, I need to shut down or I need to, it's, it, I like to say it's, it's becoming awake to your life in a way that says, I'm doing this. <laughs> now I'm shifting gears. I'm doing this, you know, and um, the word ritual comes up for me right now. Uh, m my husband and I have taken on, we've been experiencing a lot of heat here on the Northeast in the last 10 days. And we've just taken this ritual of going swimming in our bay and we just do that around 4 35 o'clock in the afternoon and it's just a dip and it's i, I kind of have this ritual of you know releasing the day and letting mm -hmm. letting the day mm -hmm. go and i don't know it's 10 minutes or something but it has brought so much joy to our life you know it's just yeah. it's it's fun to identify these things that make us happy yeah, and that's the great thing about once you start to become intentional about this, and and I, I use the word practice, and again, I know it turns some people off, but for me, over the last few years, I've become very intentional about stuff like this, and, and my wife has as well, so you talked about, um, you know, going out and dipping in the bay, I mentioned, like, we have a hummingbird feeder right next to our window where our kitchen table is, and like, every night about the time we're eating, the hummingbirds come around, so we'll, uh -huh. you know, we'll watch the hummingbird for a while. And then if there's a beautiful sunset, which there is a lot of times this time of year, we'll just go sit on the deck and watch the sunset. And and so when we call it a practice, it's just being intentional about these things and and appreciating these moments that we have in every single day and and creating those moments. That's right. That's right. I I, I want to just go back to what you said about, yeah, practice and work and everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, breaking through habits is hard work. Mm -hmm. And and I think we have to call it what it is. <laughs> you know, uh, consistency is something that uh, I encourage and invite people to because I know it's effective. You know, th there are studies. I mean, we, we know this as yogis. I know this as a yogi that 40, 90 days of consistent practice is going to change behavior. Recently, I talked to one of the people that I interviewed for the Trauma Recovery Summit. And it, she was a, a psychologist and she said, there is a scientific study that proves 90 day of consistent practice changes your brain, changes mm -hmm. the chemistry of your brain. So I, I just want to say, listen, I get it. <laughs> it is hard work. Behaviors are hard to change, but it is work that will support the rest of your life. I mean, this is the thing we've got to emphasize, right, Brian, is right. this is work that um, you will be so happy you did. <laughs> we'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, or text growth, growth, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grieftogrowth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. 
And now back to grief to growth. Well, you're right. I mean, it, it is work to change habits, but we think of habits as like negative things, like I, I smoke or I drink or I eat or whatever. We can also have positive habits. So what we do is we replace one habit with another. Like you said, it might be watching mindless TV, which can be a form of self-care if you do it. That's right. right? Sometimes I decide on, on a Saturday, I'm like, I'm going to just watch a stupid movie. And yep. I, make, I intentionally watch something that's really mindless. So that could be that, that can be intentional too, but it's right now we have all these things that we're we're wasting time on when we could be thing, doing things that are maybe more productive in terms of our our, our physical our, our mental uh, well being, like you know after dinner going to take a twenty minute walk you know just right. and, and once you start doing that that can become a habit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you're referencing back to, you know, what we were calling the original wound too, is that when we don't go in and investigate these uh, survival techniques that we adopted when we were young and we were doing the best we could, if that's the place that we are working from, you know, I mean, Michael Singer, the untethered soul, this is what his whole book was about, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's basically if, if that's our starting point and we've never grown beyond that, that that's the best we're going to do for the rest of our life. Right. So the work is really, how do we go back safely, you know, with an infrastructure, which is what I teach in my book, how do we find a way to create a foundation safe enough for us to go back and say, let me get curious about that. Wow, this this doesn't seem like a habit or a reaction or, you know, a trigger that I really want to develop further. It's one I want to move through and heal through. And once we do that, uh, we have this world open up to us, right? It's like, my God, I never knew life would be this good. Um, one of one of this is not mine, but uh, again, one of the people I interviewed for, for the trauma recovery summit said, and she said, "Harder now, easier later. Yeah, easy easier now, harder later." Yeah, and we know Brian, right? We know people, God love them, that have not been able to do the work, and at the end of their life, it's scary. It can be very, very scary. Yeah, and so. You know, I just put out a vote for don't worry about it (laughs) if it's hard, you know, don't worry about it. You can do it if you've got a proper teacher and you've got guides and you've got community around you that can help you. You can do it. Well, and the thing is, so many of us don't know that we have to do the work. We don't really don't know that. Right. We don't know how to do the work. Where do I go to find the resources? And, And that's what you offer through your normal course of. Uh, your life coaching and your trauma, you know, recovery. And let's talk about, we, we've alluded to it several times, let's talk about the Trauma Recovery Summit and what that is. Right. Well, I, I also would say that if somebody's watching this, it's they're probably a bit interested in this topic, right? right? right. So the work is probably not all that foreign to them. Uh, yes, this this incredible summit is something that I was inspired to do because as as the title indicates, it is a trauma recovery summit. Does that mean that you're going to recover by watching the summit? Not necessarily. But what it does mean is that you're going to be exposed to, gosh, I think we're up to about 38 extraordinary speakers, including you, Brian. Thank you so much for saying yes and being a part of it, that we get to hear all sorts of different topics addressed. And boy, I'll tell you, I, 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 I come away from this past three months and having spoken to all of you, having learned so much. I mean, it has increased my base of knowledge. And I know if there's one of you out there that is, is thinking about taking these next steps, that one of these topics is absolutely going to be there for you. And the way these people speak to them, it's just, it's masterful. It really is. So the summit uh, 
we're recording this in August of 2022. So when is the summit? When does registration start? And how do people find out more about it? Yeah, registration is open right now. Uh, the actual summit, we are going to open, I think, October 6th. No, I know. October 6th through 9th. Mm -hmm. So it's a three-day event. You can find out more by Trauma Recovery Summit slash Brian. Um, and, you know, just check out all the incredible, incredible offerings and topics I, I can't say enough about it, truthfully. I think it's just going to be a, a huge success and help many people. In yeah, this I'm, very I'm valuable. really honored that you asked me to be part of it. I'm really excited about it. I've been doing uh, quite a bit of work getting ready for it. I know other yeah. people have as well. It's going to be an incredible experience. And, you know, I, I also always want to be realistic with people. You're, you're not going to heal just by listening to someone. You're right. not going to heal just by reading a book. But these things can give you ideas, they can be resources for you. And then there's going to be other resources that are going to spin out of this, that you can find ways to, to, to keep moving going forward and, and start to incorporate these things into your, your daily life. Because um, so many people, and we all deal with trauma. I mean, everybody that on this planet, I think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a bug. I think it's a feature. I think we, we come here to experience trauma and, and universally we all experience it. It's just, it's how do we deal with it? You know, and for most of us, we do. We have that initial reaction when we're a child and we get that wound and, and we deal with it the best we can. And we develop these habits that kind of work, but they don't really work that well when we get to be adults and we continue to do that same thing that's not working. And so what you're offering is people a way to, to break out of that, right? To, to address it in a different way. Right. It, it really is all about awareness. And, and you know, I think it's, a very important point that you just made. It's, this is not going to be necessarily what heals you, but it could be that thing that you said, wow, I just connected so deeply with what that person said. And I want to learn more. And when you're dealing with, with, I, I think anything in life, right, it, there has to be a level of curiosity, something has to be teased inside of you that you say, wow, you know, I, I want to know more about that person. There was an intrigue there. I want to know more about that's why people take on these various specialties in their life. And I, I don't know that there is any greater gift you can give to yourself or anyone else than to really understand who you are, know your nervous system, understand what intimidates you, what fills you up who you are, and how can you best communicate that information to those you love? Yeah, I, you're, that is so, it, it's interesting because we we have worked together. And we're we're kind of like, I think, finishing each other's thoughts because, I, again, I was working on one of, one of the things I'm contributing for the summit. And I was, um, you know, the thing is we talk about self-care. We talk about, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think the initial reaction of a lot of people is I don't have time for self-care. I'm too busy doing everything else. I'm too busy working. I'm too busy being a mother. I'm too busy being a father. Um, and I tell people, if you're not doing self-care, you're not only selling yourself short, you're selling the people around you short right. because you cannot continue to put out and put out and put out without receiving. Um, so it's really, really important that we take care of ourselves first, not, not as an afterthought, but first. Well, I, I, th I would, also add to that, Brian, you know, if that too busy phrase comes up for you, really, it's like, okay, what, what are you running from? You know, yeah. because it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And at some point, there's going to be a break breakdown as there was in my own life, there was mm -hmm. a breakdown, I started breaking down physically. And it was spending three weeks in bed because of bronchial pneumonia that ultimately was like, with two young kids and a be you know, beautiful family. And I couldn't hardly take a breath. And boy, listen to the wake up calls. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you believe, and I do, I believe the universe gives us wake up calls. Um, for some people, I interview a lot of people that have near death experiences. A lot of people, yeah. it's like, they'll say I was getting these little things. And then finally, boom, I got the big one. Right. Um, but we, 
I think we set up lessons for ourselves. And if we're not getting the lesson, the lesson just keeps coming back to us and it comes back to us in different ways until we until we pay attention. Um, and, and even if you don't believe in that, as I do from a metaphysical point of view, we all know that most of us are running too hard. Most of us are we're running full throttle. We're not taking any time. And we're just like, we're exhausted. I talk to so many people right now. They're just like, I'm tired. That's because you're living life hard. You're not living life easy. Uh, and when you say you don't have time, what are you filling your day up with? We all have 24 hours in a day. We all have yeah. the same amount of time. It's like, what is your priority? That's what I ask people. Are, are you making yourself a priority? Are you making your self-care a priority? Are you right. carving that time out of your day, putting it on your calendar? Like you put everything else on your calendar. That's right. That's right. I, I think it's worth saying at this point that, you know, most of us do want to be healthy and happy and peaceful. I mean, I think most of us really do want to do, to have that. And what I've come to understand is the reason I didn't go to that initially was because I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't strong enough to look at the devastating events of my young life. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why is it that we're not going? It could be just because you don't feel strong enough. But mm -hmm. let that be, let that be just, you know, something that comes up that you're able to say, then how do I get strong enough? Right. You know, how do I take these incremental steps? It, we think it has to be this big and really all it has to be is just little digestible, <laughs> beautiful movements in, in a direction that's different than the track you're on. Yeah. And, um, and there's, there's extraordinary people out there helping people do that. And as, as this summit indicates, I mean, yeah. we, we just got a great collection of folks that are uh, doing really darn good work out there in the world. Well, you know, the thing I've realized with people, with the people that do, when they finally get to the point where they come to me, which is usually when they feel like they're at their breaking point, is um, these people are extremely strong and they're, and they're spending a lot of energy. And I'm like, you have no idea how strong you are and how much energy you're spending. And actually doing this work might seem like a lot of effort, but not doing it is even more effort. <laughs> it's, it's even more effort to try to muddle through the way that you're doing it now. As you said, it's it's a little bit of, it's like making an investment. It's like, if you, if you invest a little bit of time here and I don't, I never ask people for big changes. Cause I think that's just setting people up for failure. It's like, we're not, we're not going to try to, we're, we're going to have an ultimate goal, right? We're going to have a big goal, but what is, what is something you can do? What is something you can do right now? Is it, a, I, I was talking with someone the other day and she's just so overwhelmed. She had um, just recently lost two children within the last couple of years. Ugh. And she's like, I've got grief fog. And I can't remember anything. So I said, let's keep this really simple. I want you to start a gratitude practice. And I want you every day to just think of three things that, you know, you, that you can do before you get, that you're gra grateful about before you get out of bed. She goes, I'm not sure I can remember that. And she had mentioned me earlier, she likes a journal. I said, I'll tell you what, take a journal, set it next to the chair you're sitting in and put a pen there. And just when you think about it, write down something you're grateful for. And she goes, okay, that I can do. And I'm like, okay, that's that's our work for today. That's it. That's all we're going to do. That's great advice. That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we spend so much time running away from that which hurts, that the idea of actually turning, you know, that's how I envision it in my own mm -hmm. brain. It's like, mm -hmm. I had that experience today, you know, I woke up, it's been really busy uh, in my life and, and my family, I've got a, I live on a family property. So there's always, you know, activity. And I was overwhelmed. And I was just like, okay, what is it? What is it that you're feeling? And, you know, it was just this, this sort of visual of, turning towards myself rather than getting busier and, and, you know, let's get going. Let's, this, this feels uncomfortable. Let's just keep on moving. Mm -hmm. And just that, just that, just saying, I see you, I hear you. I, I feel the discomfort too. We're going to be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just, just have that cup of tea or, you know, I, whatever it is that sues you. That's why that bank of what makes me feel good, you know, is it that hummingbird? Is it that sunset? Is it whatever? Right. Um, those are the things we can draw on when we're, when we're not feeling great. 
Yeah, I, and I'm I'm the same way as you. I I felt overwhelmed the last couple of weeks. We're both yeah. working hard on and getting this summit ready, and yeah. it's, it's a pleasure, it's a joy, but you know it can be overwhelming. And I and I have found for me, my my thing is like get up and get something done. And now yeah. sometimes it'll be like, let's take some time and meditate right now. Uh, uh, and I'm I'm using this I'm doing this thing called positive intelligence, which I'm going to talk more about at the summit, but. I'm using this thing called positive intelligence that uses PQ reps, which is a matter of just a way of becoming present, like really quickly. So when I'm really feeling stressed out, I'm like, I'm going to take three minutes and I'm just going to, I'm just going to get into my body, you know? Wow. And, and that gives you that energy you need to go get the stuff done as opposed to just putting your head down and plowing through, which just wears you out. That's right. That's right. And that is a hard thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because you're trained probably like I am, mm -hmm. you know, get up early, get it done, you know. But if you can capture that extraordinary, what we call liminal space, you know, when you come out of sleep and you come into wake, yeah. they say, I, I, I study yoga nidra and, and they say that that is the place where all sorts of creativity lives. So if you're actually taking that and, and grabbing it and putting it here instead mm -hmm. of there, then when you go there, <laughs> there's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great practice. And I, I didn't know the technical term for it, but that's a great practice. When you wake up in the morning, don't just jump out of bed, you know, take a minute and, and feel, get, come back. I was, I, I envision just coming back into my body. I feel like when I'm sleeping, I'm out of my body. So I'm coming back into my body. So I, I feel my body. I do my gratitude practice. I think about the things I'm going to you know, do that day, but I don't like stress about them. It's like, okay, these are the things I need to get done. But right now I'm just going to be here and come, come into the body slowly. And I found that's been a really helpful practice for me. And it's all, so this, that's the thing about like something like your book. And I think the summit we can all, and I think we all have to develop our individual practices. No one can tell you what your practice is. I think right. it's, it's totally unique for every person. Yes. Yes. This acronym too, Brian, I, I love, I want to share it with you. Again, this isn't mine, but um, is it Michael Beckworth? Michael, you know Beckwith. who I'm talking? Beckwith, right? Mm -hmm. Michael Beckwith, this is his. But he said, you know, there is no greater prayer than the word help. And the ac acronym that he uses is Hello, Eternal Loving Presence. Wow. So by actually saying help, you know, and I'll say, help me, because I'm just, I'm just in a place of not knowing how to take the next step. And that that prayer, hello, eternal, loving presence, like right there. Yeah. It just, it's a beautiful, beautiful it, thing. It's funny, I don't remember ever hearing that before. But again, I was just talking to this new client the other day, and, and they were telling me they're having trouble with their prayer life. I said, if you can't pray, just say help. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to remember. It doesn't have to be long. It, it, we 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 complicate things, right? That's right. Just saying help. You know, just you know, I don't know what to pray is a prayer. You know, uh, yes. we 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 make things a lot more difficult than they they need to be. So, um, I'm really glad that Sarah that you're you're taking the wisdom that you've learned. You know, through your trauma. And the, and the ways you've learned to overcome it. And then the next step is helping other people. Uh, I think it's, I think it's beautiful what you're doing. So we've talked a lot about the summit. What do people, what could people do with you besides the summit? What other, what other offer services do you offer? Well, one of the things that's sort of just my extraordinary, like, I just, I've been dreaming about doing this forever. And I think it's called the tribe inside and the concept of this community when it occurred to me to develop it was that the title said the tribe inside not the not inside the inside tribe and what i meant by that when i asked you know i'm, I'm in meditation and i asked these questions it was that there is no developing a tribe outside until you develop the tribe inside Hmm. And so this community of people, I call it the self healers community. It's really the tribe inside is kind of the seed. So that's like the, the foundational level. And I really just get on and I speak to people about a theme of the month and resources and sort of develop this um, 
concept around uh, delivering the theme that month. The next step is, is the inner circle and that's the conversation. So we get into conversations and it's an interactive conversation uh, with those in the circle about their self-healing path based around that curated theme. Uh, then I also do a group coaching program called Awaken the Healer Inside. That just launched last November, and that is really, it's a group coaching opportunity. It, I, I work with people in a pretty deep way, and they have access to me as really probably the most access that I interact with people is through that program. Um, I do do one-on-one -on -one clients, but really only only with people that have gone through the Awake of the Healer. It's sort of a prerequisite to working with me one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. But I, I see maybe five clients a year. It's just, um, you know, I, I'm, I, as I've grown in my own work, I, my avatar, my client is really me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. people that, you know, have tried a lot of things and have are, you know, I'm a 62 year old woman are kind of in this place of wanting a deep study around the next steps. And, and uh, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to be in conversation with people that are, are interested and intrigued and curious and, and confused and, uh, you know, just really looking to find a way that aligns with their heart and spirit. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I love what you're doing. Uh, I'm excited to be part of the summit. Uh, again, I want to let people know they can re you can reach Sarah at sarahbrassard.com. It's B-R-A-S-S-A-R-D. There'll be links in the show notes, but I know sometimes people listen to, and they don't read the notes. Uh, the Trauma Recovery Summit, it's going to be October 6th through 9th. Uh, you can go to traumarecoverysummit.com slash Brian, B-R-I-A-N, to find out more information and sign up for that. I hope to see uh, a lot of you there. Sarah, anything you want to say as we wrap up today? Well, I really would just like to emphasize the point that, you know, oftentimes when we feel desperate, it can feel so lonely and it can feel so overwhelming. And if you can make, as we've discussed in today's interview, any sort of motion towards yourself, even if that's just to say help to yourself, or to a loved one or to somebody that possibly could guide you to greater learning and healing, you're worth it. Take the chance to do that. You, you deserve that. Yeah. Wow. Great wrap up. Great. Sarah, it's great seeing you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, Brian, thank you so much. You too. Don't forget to like, hit that big red subscribe button and click the notify bell. Thanks for being here.